speak your name in my ear. Posting. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We're doing it now. Once should we week. probably should put, we should probably put that in the beginning. Yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah, just so people know. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're we're switching to once a once a Sunday every Sunday, yeah. once a week now because yeah. it's it's a lot. It's a lot, and we with, you know we, with life. Yeah, uh, outside of YouTube, we've got a lot of stuff going on. So yeah. we just figured that way we can be more consistent, more time to people. If they want, if you guys want to watch the movies right before the video comes out, you can. Then you know you're up up to date. Yeah, it just it just made sense to us. So yeah. that's what we're gonna do. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's that. Yeah. Welcome back to Life Lessons in Film. Hello. And today we're going to be making sense of life through The Shape of Water. Yeah. Yeah. I took notes. You me took too. Notes. Good. Um, oh, you're getting me into the notes thing. <laughs> I see the appeal. Short, summary, taking place Cold War era in the States. Everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid. Starts off with the main character, Eliza, is a cleaner, a helper at this kind of government facility. One a day, research facility. Research facility. One day they bring in an asset. <laughs> they find out it's a fish man. This the asset, the right. fish man, it has a lot of capabilities biologically. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like they, yeah. he's, he's able to breathe in different yeah. um both yeah. land and water. Land and water and just like he's very malleable. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. biologically. And this is why he's an asset. So he's in the res research facility to be studied and the whole point is to see whether or not they can use his yeah. biological makeup and translate it to weapons mm -hmm. um of destruction. Eliza the main character, she goes back home every day. She lives above a uh, movie theater with her friend and Giles. Giles. Yeah. And they're both kind of outcasts. He's gay in a period that isn't so into that kind of thing. Yeah. And she is mute, so they both are kind of outcasts together. She Along just, with another, the other friend of hers, Zelda, Zelda, who's also a janitor, and she is of a certain skin tone. Right. That's how she's an outcast. Yes. Yeah. Eliza one day discovers the fishman, grows a bond. She feels this attachment and this connection to the fishman that she's never had with anyone else, who just always overlooked her. And they attempt to break the fishman out of the facility. After she finds out that they're, the plan is to kill, kill the fishman. Yeah. So the person who's overseeing this whole operation is Strickland, Strickland. right? The guy yeah, who's in charge of the whole operation. He's the one who calls the fishman the acid. Yeah. <laughs> He's really mean to the fishman. He's mm -hmm. really like sexist, classist, yeah. racist. Yeah. All the all ists. Of the, all of all the ists. Yeah. He is that. He's um, a cruel man. Yeah. He's a cruel man who has his own issues. Yeah. And his own, his own personal challenges. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So these are the main characters yeah. in the movie, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Strickland, he's interrogating everyone to find out the location of the fishman. After the fishman has, the been, fish broken has been, been broken out of the facility. Broken out of and looks bad on Strickland and his higher up is being hard on him. Yeah. Because that's Hoyt. how it happens. Hoyt, you just you throw the crap down the ladder. So he's trying to figure out if any, any leads and he brings the help in, Eliza and Zelda. And basically doesn't really get anything. They're not really too into helping him because he's never been nice to them. It's just like, why am I even asking the help? Uh, which I find is interesting because for me, it kind of reminded me of a lot of people, especially people in power. Although that's the interesting thing is he's in a position of power over them, but not when it comes to his higher ups. But that's where you get this effect that stratification has on people where people want to punch down because they're getting punched down themselves and they also don't appreciate the uh, kind of symbiotic relationship that everyone has in a business or a family or whatever, but everyone relies on each other. Without the help, within one day, people would be walking around in their beef everywhere and they wouldn't be able to function, right? But it's so easy for people because they simply just don't do the same routine every day or for whatever other reason, they see people as the other in different positions in the, in the job. He forgets that they all rely on each other a lot for it to function. From the very beginning, he assumes the sense of superiority and he has this idea that, oh, of course, I mean, if you're a janitor, you're mute, you're black. He says something, I don't remember what word he uses, but he's like, do you understand what that word is? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what that means? Um, just assuming that these people are probably not educated. And then I remember he talks about, I know that this speech looks interesting but it's just a creature it's just that or something like that and we are made in the image of god talking about you know human beings are the more so they're superior and he's like god is something like god kind of looks like us you know mm -hmm. me you know you maybe a little bit more like me you know <laughs> 
referring to Zelda at this point. You may think that thing looks human. Stands on two legs, right? But we're created in the Lord's image. You don't think that's what the Lord looks like, do you? I wouldn't know, sir, what the Lord looks like. Well, human, Zelda, he looks like a human, like me. Or even you. Maybe a little more like me, I guess. He thinks that, well, you know, if you're a minority, then there are just certain things that you don't have access to intellectually or otherwise. Anything that's respectable, you don't really have access to. He just kind of assumes that automatically. But he's also a very interesting character because he's this very, you know, parody of American exceptionalism. You mm -hmm. know, when you think about it, like he has like how, where he lives, perfect house, mm -hmm. kids, you know, who every time he's eating breakfast, they'll give him a yeah. kiss goodbye yeah. and you know the wife just always just kind of doting on him yeah making him honey you must eat this and whatever you know yeah. it looks like something you'd watch in a movie yeah right like and an it, ad from that time an ad from that time yeah. yeah right like and then but then when it comes to carnal knowledge time <laughs> which at first the wife initiates you mm -hmm. know like hey honey let you why, why don't you go upstairs and get undressed mm -hmm. and we think hmm, oh, this is interesting maybe they do have a, 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 a relationship of reciprocity where needs are met and then when it's time to get down and dirty her needs don't they just completely cast aside what, what needs doesn't even want her to talk to shut up you know yeah. like puts his hand over her mouth and he's clearly so unhappy in that marriage in his life and then on top of that his job is very stressful he's obsessed with this idea of what it means he doesn't fail i don't yeah. fail you don't fail yeah. and he, even as he acts mm -hmm. the way he acts with people it's it's not really natural it's just mm -hmm. the idea of what he thinks someone mm -hmm. in superior position yeah. would act to yeah. other people he's just as afraid as everybody else which is very interesting. Trying to compensate. Other thing that came up for me, I guess. Fishman, of course. I don't know, the relationship between him and Eliza obviously is very interesting, very beautiful. I think he represents people who are othered. And so when Eliza meets him, it's not like, oh my God, I'm witnessing this insanity or nobody else in the world has ever seen a fishman. What? Hold the thought. Hold the thought on the fish man. Back to the fish man. Yeah. The relationship between Eliza and the fish man. The fish man represents subalterns. She doesn't see him as like a kind of like a circus act type mm -hmm. of thing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? If you see a man with like five heads or something like that, it's not that. It's she sees him as familiar. She sees herself in this man. I think, for example, minorities um, like Zelda, like Giles, and like Eliza, they're also close with each other and they get along very mm -hmm. easily. When you think of Zelda, for example, she's working in a facility where it's mostly white people. Eliza can't speak. And so they gravitate towards each other and mm -hmm. they take care of each other. And it's easy to interact with, mm -hmm. with each other because they have this lived experience that is so similar. Yeah. There's this unspoken understanding that you have for this person who may look different to you and whose experience with disenfranchisement is probably different than yours in some way, but is similar at the same time. Yeah. And so that's where I feel like when Eliza meets the fish man, it, it is more just kind of like, I see myself in you. That's the first thing. But then the second thing is the, the aspect of them falling in love with each other. And for her, it's two things, I think. The fact of what she says, he sees me as I am and does not see anything that I lack, yeah. takes me as I am without yeah. any kind of expectations. I think she obviously, living in the world that she lives in as a mute, anybody who would look at her in that way and see her beautiful as she is, that would be something, I think, a very meaningful experience yeah. for her and a certain comfort that she's never experienced. It's hard for people to love you and accept you as you are. When you think about it, even things like even your family or your friends, there's always a, why don't you put your hair up a certain way, honey? <laughs> or, you know, you would look so much cuter if you wore dresses more sweetheart all of these things are saying to you that there's there's something you lack and it gives you the, the sense that the people that are in your life don't necessarily accept you as you are or love you as you are or even think that anybody could love you as you are these are experiences that all of us have in our lives i'm definitely also i know that i'm also guilty of looking at people and think you could do this you could do that even to myself we don't always accept ourselves as how we are so then it's hard to do that for other people and when you meet someone who has that level of acceptance, that kind of like childlike acceptance, because when you think about babies or toddlers when they're growing up before they're sullied by the world, they see you, you show up, you're just beautiful as you are. They don't need you to put on makeup. They don't need you to do anything. You're perfect as you are, right? Mm -hmm. And so this man, that's how he has that sincerity of a newborn. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it would be easy to fall yeah. in love with someone who has that kind of heart. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I forget the exact line, but basically Eliza wants to break Fishman out of the center, the research place. And Giles is like, this is too dangerous. It's illegal. 
bad, bad idea. We're gonna get, it's, it's not gonna end well. It's like, it's not even, it's not even human. Why would we risk our everything? Something that's not even, we don't even know what it is. And then she counters back with being like, if we do nothing, then we also, we're not human either. What we do when we see injustice. There are a lot of things that he says to try and get out of helping Eliza. We're all lonely. He's lonely, I'm lonely too. And then he's like, well, you know, I don't have the power. You act, you're you asking me to do this thing to help you, but I, I'm powerless. These things are, are very interesting, you know what I mean? Because firstly, the fact of recognizing that someone else is as lonely as you are, you actually having that understanding, because you actually have experienced it. So it's not even something that you have to imagine. Mm -hmm. You know what it feels like. So why wouldn't it come easily to you to actually help someone out in that same situation that you know is a painful situation mm -hmm. to exist in? That's something that's really interesting to me. But when he talks about like, I'm powerless, I guess then that makes sense why he doesn't help, even though he empathizes with this guy. A lot of us feel that way, right? Like we have this idea of, well, you know, I don't have money or I am not influential in some way. Who am I? What would I, what resources do I even have mm -hmm. to even begin to actually get this guy justice or anyone justice, mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of us fall into that. You always think about all of these things that you're afraid of, the capacity that you don't have. Yeah. But I think a lot of the times, whatever vision of helping someone we have is we always, I think we have these grand designs in our mind of what helping someone would look like. If you don't have the kind of resources that would match this vision that you have of what help would look like, then let's look at, okay, what would 1% of that vision of helping someone look like? Anybody can help, even if it means just raising awareness. Maybe you don't have the money to fund something or you don't have the power to make something stop, an injustice stop, but you do have a voice, mm -hmm. right? You have a voice you can raise awareness to this is happening you can maybe start a GoFundMe there's always something you can do and I think sometimes we stop taking action because we see as this problem is huge and it will require a huge solution you can just chip away at the solution little by little when is a man done proving himself when is enough enough he failed once only once what does that make him does that make him a failure when is a man done sir Proving himself. I think Strickland, yeah, is also a good example. He represents kind of the anxiety or the pressure people feel in modern society of needing to be perfect all the time, needing to be more productive, constantly need to move up, needing to, there's just that pressure on yourself all the time. And I think a lot of people feel that, where it's like, when have I proven myself worthy? When can I finally be accepted for who I am or just be accepted for what I've done. When am I yeah. done? When am I done? In terms of work, yeah. when are you ever done? Yeah. That's the whole point of like promotions, right? You know that there's the hierarchy at work. You are never really done. The way some companies work is that they kind of pit employees against each other. So mm -hmm. even outside of getting promoted, you're always compared to other people. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Whenever someone does something great at work, congratulations, Tom, Tom did ABC. And then everybody else kind of feels like, yeah. oh, I, I'm nobody at this point. I need to get my act together and be the next person that's congratulated in the mm -hmm. next meeting how am I going to do that and even that guy who gets congratulated in mm -hmm. that meeting he has now set a bar yeah. and he can't rest no. just that accolade he receives in that mm -hmm. moment he won't be able to rest mm -hmm. he has to maintain that or surpass it and that's life that's how we are wouldn't you be uptight if that's the way that yep. you, that's in that kind of setup I mean I saw I certainly am uptight <laughs> in that kind of world mm -hmm. this is the environment in which Strickland works and the environment we all work yeah we all live yeah we're all Strickland yeah we're all Strickland a little, nicer, in some, in some, a little yeah. nicer but yeah we all have those kinds of pressures the world in general is like that because even when he goes to go to get that car i remember the salesman is like of course this is what everybody is getting <laughs> this kind of car and even this color yeah first he doesn't like that it's a teal color but yeah. once he buys it and it's part of his identity then he's yeah. defensive of people not knowing that it's teal. it's a teal color yeah. yeah it's not enough to just get anything that isn't a teal color cadillac mm -hmm. it's not enough next year when limited edition i don't know a different color orange cadillacs mm -hmm. then his one isn't going to be enough anymore He's yeah. going, so there's never any rest. Perhaps I would just warn you about the truth of these facts and the tale of love and loss and the monster who tried to destroy it all. What does a monster actually look like? It reminded me of the Green Mile. The Green Mile, you have John Coffey, a soft, gentle soul. And then he's perceived as a monster just based on his, what he looks like. And then the guy who's actually a monster mm -hmm. is super tiny and soft yeah. looking yeah. and weak yeah. compared to John Coffey. And so in this movie, who is the monster? Mm -hmm. Is it really the fish man or is it Strickland? I vote you know what Strickland. I mean? But when you look at Strickland and his cookie cutter life, yeah. you wouldn't think, oh no, no, he's just, you know, yeah. a hardworking guy. Yeah. He's just a true blue 
red-blooded American. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. Who is the monster here, right? Mm-hmm. That's another thing I think, you know, when you're interacting with people, remembering those kinds of things. Appearance basically. versus actions. Actions show the monster. Yeah. Just because a person looks appealing to you externally doesn't mean that internally that they would be appealing. So don't assume. On top of that, if someone does not look appealing, don't assume that it's the same internally. It's interesting because like when you're growing up, these are all things that you hear. Your teachers will tell you that. Yeah. Don't judge a book by its cover. Do you know what that means, kids? Yeah. And then they'll explain it to you. Then you grow up and we somehow forget these things yeah. as we're interacting with people. Yeah. It's just one of those things that are so... I don't know why it's so hard to do that. I guess people, we do get jaded as we're, as we're growing and living. But this movie, I think if you really look beyond it being a romantic fairy tale type yeah. of story between a human being yeah. and a, a fish man, it has a lot of those yeah. moral undertones there that people can chew on. It's yeah. more than just like a fish out of water, fish back into water, <laughs> maybe movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it, I feel like. Yeah, I think that's, that's some stuff that yeah. we talked about that we noticed from The Shape of Water. How about you? How about you? Yeah. What did you guys think? Have you seen it? Let yeah. us know. Share your thoughts on our thoughts in the comments down below. And... That's it though. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks everyone for watching. Yeah. And until next time, that's rip. Bye. Peace. Fuck. You are a god. <laughs>